Welcome to GRE. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. A tidal wave of money that you probably don't know about is going to be released by the Fed, and it will create some distortion to markets. Where is it coming from? When will it happen? How big is it going to be? Which markets does it promise to push up in price? And what's going to happen to inflation and interest rates today on Get Rich Education? You know, starting in real estate seems hard for some. Even experienced investors can find it difficult to achieve the success that they had hoped for. What if there was one small change everyone could make that would solve these challenges? Allie Boone offers a book that really no one else has. It's an easy-to-understand glimpse into the real estate investing industry and your mindset. It's life lessons on hacking your mind before you hack your wallet. Her book to grab on Amazon is called Not Your How-To Guide to Real Estate Investing. Most rental property investors choose either cash flow or home price appreciation, but one real estate market can give you both Jacksonville, Florida. With 27% lower home prices than the national median, 1% higher gross rents, and Jacksonville has appreciated 34% more than other comparable cash flow markets over the last 30 years. Get positive cash flow today and appreciation for tomorrow. To invest for cash flow and growth in Jacksonville, go to cashflowandgrowth.com. You're listening to the show that has created more financial freedom than nearly any show in the world. This is Get Rich Education. Welcome to GRE. From Flanders, Belgium to Finnish Lapland and across 188 nations worldwide, I'm Keith Weinhold. This is Get Rich Education. As a longtime contributor to the show here, today's guest, macroeconomist Richard Duncan, sometimes we reach out to him and we tell him that we'd like to have him back on the show in case it's been a while. This time he reached out to me and said that there's something your audience really needs to know right now. So that's why he's here. And there is something that you really ought to know. He'll be with us in a moment. Now, sometime last year, I was grabbing some takeout burritos from my favorite fast, casual Mexican restaurant. It's called Qdoba. It's a lot like Chipotle. When it was time to pay for the burritos, I got my credit card out to tap to pay at the terminal. But it was the first time that I was asked a little question on the display that the restaurant had never asked me before in my life. On that day and every day since, it asked me to enter a tip amount. 0%, 5%, 10%, 15%. 15%. So you've probably been confronted with this. The cashier is standing right across the counter from you and the tip guilt creeps in on you. But see, there wasn't any waiter service at this restaurant before and there still never was. It's a takeout place, so the service level is lower, but I just quickly chose 5%. And lately, as I've thought about that some more, I've always left a higher tip amount because I reasoned that people are serving me in the pandemic. But I doubt that the prompting for a tip will go away when the pandemic goes away. It struck me. This is consumer price inflation. In the past few years, you've seen it. More businesses put a tip jar on the counter or they prompt you for a tip on the little display thing even though the service level hasn't increased one bit or the quality of the ingredients of the food haven't increased one bit, well, not only is this tip indicative of inflation, but I don't expect that it's measured in any government-reported inflation statistics like CPI or PCE, because those metrics, they strip out measuring the food and the energy in that compilation for that basket of goods. By the way, I was at Subway restaurant the other day, and they still did not ask me for a tip. It's like there wasn't even an option to leave one. But isn't it interesting that these popular measures of consumer inflation, they not only exclude the cost of assets like real estate, but they strip out food and energy, saying that they're too volatile. I mean, my gosh, we have stats that measure price changes. Yet it excludes the very things that change in price. And increasingly, my experience and most Americans' experience with increased tipping practices over the past decade, it demonstrates then that inflation is often higher than what's reported. 
And the other thing that you need to know is that the steak burrito with queso from Qdoba is outrageously tasty. <laughs> we are talking about the national economy today, which means that some big numbers could get thrown around here. One billion, gajillion, fifillion, shabadoodle, million, shawnee, gawashly, million. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that again. Well, hey, macroeconomists need to talk in big dollar terms, so we're usually using words like billion and trillion dollars in these discussions, and million, that's just way too small of a number to matter anymore. Million is irrelevant here. You know, after trillion comes quadrillion and then quintillion with three respective orders of magnitude between each moniker there, so hey, we'll see if quadrillion comes up in discussion today. I expect that we're going to hear about even more Fed liquidity introduced into the market, increasing the chance that the surging party in house prices is going to continue. Rent amounts, probably not as much. Let's go. This week's feature guest is a classically trained economist by way of Vanderbilt and Babson. He has worked with both the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund. But despite that lofty experience, he's still accessible to you as he has been here with us about annually since he was our first ever guest of any kind here on GRE back in 2014. He's the author of three books on the global economic crisis, including the international bestseller, The Dollar Crisis. And it really forecasts the global economic wipeout of 2008 with some really extraordinary accuracy. He is an American that's lived in Asia for decades now, and he's really known for his bi-weekly economics publication of the video newsletter, MacroWatch, which can be found on his website at richardduncaneconomics.com. Welcome back to GRE, Richard Duncan. Thank you, Keith. It's a pleasure to be back. Thanks for having me back. You were last here with us in July, and we talked then, you were talking about how it was probably best to inject liquidity to help float the economy out of the deep recession. That's largely happened. More recently, we've had President Biden introduce his American Rescue Plan. That was a $1.9 trillion plan. Since you've last been here in July, we've seen an asset price run up in vaccines and that new president, and an unemployment rate that's now down to 6.2%, which is getting kind of low, though I don't think all is well. So tell us about how do we make sense of this? What's an investor and a consumer need to know today, Richard? There are two big forces at work now. One, in the markets, there's a growing concern that there's going to be higher level of inflation, and that's pushing up interest rates, and that's causing a lot of nervousness in the stock market, for instance. On the other side, there is a tidal wave of new liquidity hitting the financial markets in the form of quantitative easing, but also from another important source, which we can discuss later. And this extraordinary surge of liquidity into the markets is pushing up asset prices. And that's why we've seen the Dow and the S&P at, at record highs very recently. And real estate as well. When you were last with us, we had year-over-year -year real estate prices of about 5% in appreciation. And now, depending on the measure you look at, they're up 15%. I've seen that. That's quite extraordinary. With all this monetary injection, are the inflation fears legitimate or are they unfounded? Because when we look back to the quantitative easing cycles, which is just a really nice way of the Fed saying money printing or currency creation, we had a lot of those money printing cycles coming off the global financial crisis to help get us out of that. That was about 12 years ago. And a lot of people then, Richard, I heard them saying high inflation's coming. This big wave of high inflation is going to be coming, but it didn't happen. So is there anything that might make these current liquidity injections give us a different outcome and in higher inflation despite it not happening last time? Is there anything different here? When we look, look ahead for the next year, we still don't know with any certainty what will happen. One of the big unknowns is, will there be a very large new infrastructure plan from the Biden administration that passes through Congress? There is a possibility that we could have a two or $3 trillion infrastructure bill. Now, that wouldn't be spent in the one year alone. It would probably be spread out over several years. But that's a very big wild card, and that will make a big difference as to whether there is a real possibility of sustained inflation or not. But let's look at where we are now, and let's look at how the Fed views the world. 
right now, the level of inflation that the Fed targets, the Fed looks at what it calls the core personal consumption expenditure price index. Right. So this is the core PCE. And a lot of people think the Fed looks at the CPI, the consumer price index, but they don't. They look at the core PCE for making their decisions. That's right. And they're not all that different. What they share in common is that they strip out volatile food and energy prices. And so at the core PCE level, the inflation rate now is 1.5%. And the Fed's target is 2%. So we're still well below the Fed's target. So we're looking at core PCE. So this excludes food and energy. And it's important to understand why they exclude the commodity prices, because commodity prices are wildly volatile. And in fact, they're shooting up now on the back of all of this liquidity and stimulus that's going into the economy. But they won't stay high. They go up and then they come down. They go up radically and they come down radically. I'll give you just one example out of many. In June of 2008, the Bloomberg Commodity Price Index was up 40%. Nine months later, it was down 53% year on year. These things swing wildly and it's, the Fed couldn't possibly change monetary policy quickly enough to affect the economy in a way that would control swings in commodity prices. What would you do? One year when the commodity prices shoot up 50%, what would the Fed do? Hike interest rates up to 10% trying to control the spike in commodity prices? That just wouldn't work. So that's why they strip out the inflation uh, in commodity prices when they try to manage the economy through monetary policy. So what really matters for core price inflation is wages. That's the most important thing by far, wage price inflation. And it doesn't look like we're going to have any wage price inflation anytime soon. First, 10 million fewer Americans have jobs now than a year ago. Yeah. So we first got to put those people back to work before we can expect any wage price inflation. And even before the pandemic started, when the US unemployment rate was 3.5%, that was pretty much a 50-year low. Right. We still had quite limited wage price inflation. At the very peak, it was 3.8% growth year on year in wages. Why was that? Well, there's a very important change that's occurred in, in the global economy in recent decades. We not only have to be concerned about the number of people employed or unemployed in the United States, we have a global economy now. And we buy not only American made product, but of course, we buy products from made everywhere in the world. And the world is a very large place full of very cheap labor. We could even go back to a point where we were before the pandemic when we re-employ these 10 million Americans and still find that we don't have significant wage price inflation. So that's the way the Fed sees the world. They don't think that we are going to have a sustainable surge in inflation. Recently, they've made some very important changes as to how they intend to operate monetary policy going forward. In the past, they would act preemptively. If they thought the unemployment rate was getting too low, then they would begin increasing the federal funds rate. Because if the unemployment rate fell too low, they believed this would lead to wage price inflation and lead to sustained inflation at the core PCE level. And so they would act preemptively and start hiking just to make sure that there was no wage price inflation. What they've seen in the last couple of cycles, even when the employment rate gets to a very low level, there's still not been significant wage price inflation. So they've changed that policy now. And they said, we're no longer going to act preemptively when the unemployment rate gets low. We're going to wait until we see the whites of the eyes of inflation. We're going to wait until we actually see inflation pick up. And that's one change in their policy. Another change in their policy, and this was all announced in, in August last year, is they've said, look, we haven't been able to meet our inflation target of 2% on a sustained basis for decades. I mean, for instance, since 2000, the average rate of core PCE inflation has been 1.7%. And since 2010, it's been 1.6%. So they've been undershooting their inflation target year after year after year. And so they've now said, look, we're going to change our target. It's no longer going to be 2%. It's going to be an average of 2% over the long run. And that's very significant because that means they're going to allow it to run above 2% for certainly months and potentially even a couple of years, given how long they have undershot their inflation target. 
So it seems quite unlikely that the Fed is going to tighten monetary policy this year through the end of the year, at least, and probably longer. And this is what the, the Fed keeps telling us in speech after speech and at the, in their FOMC meetings. On every possible occasion, Chairman Powell and his colleagues all say we are not going to tighten monetary policy well into the future. That means no interest rate hikes. It also means they're going to continue creating, as they keep saying, at least $120 billion every month through quantitative easing. So that's unlikely to change. Inflation is not going to be sustainable enough to force the Fed to tighten. Now, it is quite possible that we're going to see inflationary pressures start ticking up. And for instance, in April this year, the inflation number is probably not going to look pretty at all, but that's a year-on-year -year effect. Last year in April, we were in the midst of the pandemic, the economy was collapsing, and prices fell. And so when you compare prices this April with prices last April, you're going to see a spike in inflation. But that's just going to be transitory. It's not going to last. The Fed's going to ignore that. The question is, will the markets ignore that? Right. Or will the markets become spooked and drive interest rates higher? That's a possibility. Yes. So now our listeners have an idea of when they do hear that inflation number in April that know that they're measuring back to last year when there was somewhat of a downtick. So you might see an outsized inflation number. That's right. And without not the core level, but the headline level of consumer price inflation or PCE price inflation, with the commodity prices picking up, those headline numbers will also move higher. But again, due entirely to the pickup in commodity prices. And the pickup in commodity prices, well, the commodity prices go up and they go down. It doesn't last. If food prices go up, the farmers plant more food and the next year they go back down again. There may be a scare because the headline inflation numbers start moving higher as well, in which case investors, and particularly in the bond market, may be worried that the bond yields will start moving higher. And that might make them afraid to buy bonds, which would be self-enforcing. If investors stop buying bonds, then bond prices will fall and bond yields will move up. And that's what we have been seeing in recent weeks. There's been a rapid increase in the 10-year government bond yield that's really startled and surprised. That's made people. those mortgage interest rates rise for us real estate investors. Right. And so the 10-year government bond yield in the US bond was just 93 basis points at the end of last year. In other words, less than 1%. Well, it's now shot up to 1.6%. So that's a very big move in a short space of time. And most of that move has occurred within the last month or so, or a good part of it. And so there is a possibility that bond prices will keep moving higher if investors fear that inflation is going to pick up and stop buying bonds. If the interest rates on the 10-year government bond yield move up too quickly, then that's going to cause some problems, First, particularly for the stock market and the high beta stocks, the really speculative things. Because after all, the stock market is, is a bubble to start with. There's a wild frenzy going on in the, in the markets with things like Tesla shooting up and, and the Robin Hood boys pushing this and that stock without any economic fundamentals whatsoever. The markets are very expensive and vulnerable to any sort of shocks and significantly higher 10-year bond yield would be a shock that could really do damage to the stock market if the bond yields move up too quickly. And of course, as you said, that bond yields move up, the government bond yields, and that's going to push mortgage rates up as well. And that will quickly cool down this boom in, in the property market. But the Fed always has the option to prevent bond yields from going higher. The Fed can control the 10-year government bond yield at absolutely any level it wants to. For instance, right now, the 10-year government bond yield is 1.6%. If it suddenly shoots up to 1.8%, 1.9%, or 2%, the Fed could say become worried that that would destabilize the stock market and damage the economy at a time when they're still focused on getting the unemployment rate down. So the Fed could simply make an announcement that instead of buying $120 billion worth of bonds every month through quantitative easing, they could say, we're going to double that this month to $240 billion worth of bonds. And in fact, we're going to buy $120 billion worth of bonds today. <laughs> or <laughs> they could say, we've decided that it's in the best interest of the economy and in getting these people back to work if the 10-year bond yield is 1%. 
And we are going to continue buying government bonds, as many as necessary, until we push the bond prices up and the bond yields back down to 1%. And we're going to continue with this policy, pegging the 10-year government bond yield at 1% for the next one year, for instance. They could print as, create as much money as necessary, buy as many government bonds as necessary to hold the 10-year bond yield at 1%, if that's what they decide, or 1.5, or 1.7, or whatever level they choose. That's called yield curve control. And that's what the Bank of Japan has been doing since 2016. It's been very effective in controlling the Japanese government bond yield exactly where the Bank of Japan wants it to be. And the Fed could do the same. So the Fed does have the ability to keep the interest rates from going higher if it chooses to do so. Japan often comes up in these conversations. It's because things are so screwed up over there in Japan. Let's see what they're doing. And if it's that messed up over there, let's see if what they're tinkering with creates damage. And if it doesn't, maybe that's something we could do. It's just so funny how Japan often comes into these conversations this way. So we've got some learnings here. The Fed is currently creating $120 billion a month. That's a substantial part of these liquidity injections that we're talking about. And we also learned that when the Fed looks to steer inflation policy, they're not looking at commodities commodity prices as a forecaster for what they may need to do with inflation policy, but instead they look at wage price inflation as to what's instructive to the Fed as to what they might want to do with inflation controls. That's right. And because back in the 1960s and 1970s, the government was spending a lot of money, large budget deficits, and the Fed was helping to finance those budget deficits by creating money. And that led to not only a pickup in commodity prices, but it led to full employment in the United States and full industrial capacity utilization. All the factories were pumping out as many goods as they could, but given their limited capacity. And pretty soon wages started moving higher. And people began to expect that inflation would be five, six, seven percent next year. And so they would demand higher wages, six, seven percent wage growth every year. And this led to what became known as wage push inflation spiral. And that's when we saw the inflation rate go up into the double digits, into the teens, even at the core level. So that's what the Fed doesn't want to see happen. But the world has changed since then. Back in the 1960s and 70s, the US trade with the rest of the world was in balance. In fact, up until the breakdown of the Bretton Woods system in 1971, trade between countries had to balance. Because if a country had a big trade deficit with another country, they would have to pay for that deficit by shipping gold to the other country. And they would run out of gold. And since gold was money, their economy would go into a terrible crash and they would stop buying things from other countries. So trade balanced. But once the Bretton Woods system broke down in 1971, trade started coming unbalanced. And it really became unbalanced beginning in the early 1980s during the Reagan years, years of very large budget deficits. And once the US started running large trade deficits, then suddenly the fear about wage push inflation disappeared because the United States realized it could buy things from other countries where the goods are made with very low labor cost, like Thailand or later China. Once we started running very large trade deficits, for instance, the trade deficit blew out from zero effectively in 1980 to 3.5% of US GDP in 1985 and to 6% of GDP in 2006. And so by being able to buy things from the rest of the world with very low cost labor, this meant we didn't have to be concerned about full employment in the US causing wage push inflation because buying things from low cost labor meant that there was downward pressure on US wages. Wages haven't gone up in the US since these trade deficits began. On a real basis, and, yeah. And so it's a completely different world we're living in now. It's much more difficult to actually orchestrate higher wages, even if you try. But what we're going to see now with these massive stimulus programs going ahead, $1.9 trillion stimulus bill, we're going to see the US current account deficit, the trade deficit is going to blow out again. As the Americans buy more goods, we're going to buy them from other countries. And so the trade deficit is going to become very large. And that will be the mechanism that prevents wages from going up in the US and prevents a lot of inflation in the US. But we're certainly going to see a very much larger trade deficit. It's probably going to break new record highs, at least in dollar amounts and very possibly in terms of as a percent of GDP as well. 
I want to bring some context to the inflation discussion. Some people aren't aware that millennials and Gen Zers, younger people, they really haven't experienced substantial inflation. So if you're a younger listener and you're thinking, you know, why are you talking about this inflation? You know, it's usually 1%, 2%, maybe 3%. It doesn't really matter very much. Well, if you have that context, understand that in 1980, inflation spiked at 15%. Mortgage interest rates in 1981 peaked over 18%. So these rates are real. They can really happen. I don't think Richard and I are saying that this is going to happen anytime soon, but this is a potential. This is what can happen. And this has happened in many people's lifetimes. So just to give you some context on what can really happen here, it's not always such a subtle thing like it has been these past couple decades or so. And Richard, we talk about all this currency supply that we're bringing on. You talked about the Fed creating $120 billion a month. So much it seems like funny money to a lot of people, and it's difficult to wrap their minds around that. I have an analogy that I want to make, and I want to know what you think about this. Is it currency supply plus velocity that equals inflation? Is that the way that you see it? So therefore, my analogy is with all this currency creation at $120 billion a month lately, is that like stacking up wood in a wood pile and the wood pile or this kindling for a fire to potentially start keeps getting higher? And then the spark to set that inflation fire ablaze is that spark velocity of money, meaning there's a consumer demand increase because the economy's picked up again. That velocity spark to set fire to this big wood pile to create inflation. Well, a lot of people still believe that because that's what was taught in textbooks for decades, if not centuries, but it really doesn't work that way anymore. And it's a bit technical to go into, but you were talking about the money creation. So what you're referring to is the monetary base. And the monetary base used to be gold. It was easy to understand when it was gold, but now gold has nothing to do with it. Now it's made up of physical dollar bills, which are uh, federal reserve notes, but much more importantly, bank reserves the amount of cash that banks have in their bank accounts at the Fed. Those two things together account for the monetary base. In the past, if the monetary base increased, if gold in the country grew, then that allowed credit to expand a lot more. If the credit expanded a lot, that would make the economy boom and that would tend to lead to inflation in a domestic economy that couldn't buy from low-wage countries. But all of that has changed. I mean, first of all, there's no longer any connection between the monetary base and the amount of credit that can be created by the banking system. In the past, there was a direct connection between how much gold there was in the country and how much credit the banking system and the whole economy could create. Banks were required to keep a certain amount of reserve requirements so that they had enough cash on hand. If their depositors all got frightened and demanded their deposits back, then they would have enough cash to give it to them. And so they had to keep reserve requirements. And this level of reserve requirements limited how many bank loans they could make. That was crucial to this whole framework that you're discussing. Reserve requirements limited how much credit could be created by the banking system. But over time, the level of reserve requirements was reduced to such a small level that by 2008, there were no reserves to speak of. And even last year, they formally ended this requirement altogether. The banks do not have to keep any reserves, zero reserves, any longer. There's no connection between the monetary base and how much credit the banking system can create, for one thing. So it doesn't matter what the velocity of the monetary base is, because it's entirely unconnected to the credit base, and it's the credit base that matters. The second thing, you can also talk about the velocity of M2, which is deposits in the banking system. But you can talk about the velocity of M2. That also has become irrelevant for similar reasons. For instance, 100 years ago, the banking system provided most of the credit for the economy when these theories were developed. And so the amount of deposits in the banking system mattered because the amount of deposits determined how much credit the banking system could create. But our economy has evolved so much now that bank loans account for so much less of the total credit supply now than they did 100 years ago, that no matter what happens to the amount of bank credit, it's still not very significant in terms of the overall economy, because most of the credit is coming from other sources. 
not banks. Even M2, and the velocity of M2, it's irrelevant as well. And then finally, underlying all that, you have what we discussed earlier. We don't have a closed domestic economy anymore. We have a global economy. So we can buy from overseas and we're no longer constrained by the domestic constraints in labor and domestic industrial capacity that constrained us. I have an analogy. Our economy is like a fish in a fishbowl. <laughs> the economy is the fish is in a fishbowl. But this fishbowl, because of globalization, has now been dropped into the ocean. So the domestic constraints that used to limit how much government spending and how much money creation we could get away with before we had high rates of inflation, those constraints no longer exist. The fish just has to swim out the top of the fishbowl into the big ocean. And we have a whole world of low-cost labor and unused industrial capacity that's going to prevent inflation for the rest of our lives, on a sustained basis at least, unless globalization breaks down. If globalization were to break down, and we return to this closed domestic economy like we had in the 1960s, then we would once again learn what it's like to have 10, 15% inflation. Sounds like you do not see the prospects for that anytime soon, maybe not even in our lifetimes. Not on a sustainable basis. We may get some pickup. Inflation has been extremely low. We've been flirting with deflation. So yes, I wouldn't be surprised to see the inflation rates move somewhat higher, especially in the short term. And again, as I said at the beginning, much will depend on how large the infrastructure bills are. If we have enormously large infrastructure spending, then yes, it's possible that could cause, well, wages and inflation to move higher. So we'll have to wait and see what happens there. But as long as we have this ocean full of low-cost labor and unused global industrial capacity, it's hard to see how we're going to have a sustained rise in wages and core inflation in the United States, even with this massive spending by the government and this incredible money creation by the Fed pushing up the base money supply and M2, et cetera, et cetera, still going to be hard to generate inflation on a sustained basis above the Fed's 2% target. We're talking with Macro Watch's Richard Duncan about inflation and the prospects for it. We're going to come back and talk more about the potential future direction of interest rates. That's next. I'm Keith Weinhold. This is Get Rich Education. Hey, is your IRA in a real estate syndication? Yikes, a 37% UBIT tax could hit you, but you still have a chance to set up your EQRP and avoid this. Did you make too much money in 2020 and need more deductions? Now federal law lets you set up an EQRP in 2021 and get deductions for last year, yeah, retroactively. Even put old IRA and 401k money in Bitcoin, gold, or your own business. Get control of all of your retirement money, tax and penalty free. Text EQRP in all capital letters to 72000. The people that our listeners can't stop talking about are Ridge Lending Group and MLS 42056. They provided you with more loans than anyone. It's where I got my last few loans, and they finance single-family income property up to fourplexes. They're the number one lender for both beginners and veterans. Start your pre-qualification, chat with President Chaley Ridge personally, and you'll end up with your custom plan for expanding your cash flowing portfolio. Start at RidgeLendingGroup.com. This is author Kristen Tate. Listen to Get Rich Education with Keith Weinhold and don't quit your daydream. Welcome back to Get Rich Education. We're talking with Richard Duncan, richardduncaneconomics.com, where he's the author of the long-running MacroWatch video newsletter so that you can make better macroeconomic decisions yourself. Richard, prior to the break, we were talking generally about consumer price inflation. If someone wanted to buy a new canoe or a bunch of potatoes or something like that. But then there's the asset price inflation where we have seen substantial run-ups in prices of almost everything from real estate to stocks to mutual funds to cryptocurrency and so on. So talk to us more about the asset price inflation that we've been seeing with all these liquidity injections that you talked about. We have seen, unlike consumer price inflation, which has been very contained because of the deflationary forces of globalization, on the other hand, we have been seeing a lot of asset price inflation with stocks going up and home prices going up as well, as you mentioned earlier. 
it's not surprising that we are seeing so much asset price inflation because after all, the Fed is creating $120 billion a month and pumping it into the financial markets. That's going to continue at least until the end of the year. Unless the Fed does a radical monetary policy U-turn, we can pretty much count on that to continue. And that's a lot of money. If you multiply $120 billion a month by 12 months, that's more than $1.4 trillion. There's something else going on just in the next four months that is going to have a very powerful impact on this as well. It's going to add much more liquidity than just what the Fed is adding. And that has to do with the Treasury Department. So the Treasury Department raises money through taxes and selling bonds, and then it spends that money. But the Treasury Department has a bank account at the Fed. It's called the Treasury General Account. And last year, something extraordinary happened. Normally, at least up until 2008, there was very little amount of money in this Treasury General Account. On a chart, you can barely see it because after 2008, it became much larger. And at the end of 2019, it was roughly 400 billion, which was a lot higher than it had been before. It would fluctuate between 200 billion and 400 billion, for example, for a few years. But last year, something extraordinary happened. It shot up from 400 billion to a peak of 1.8 trillion. This was just off the charts compared with anything that had ever happened before. And I looked at this and just could not understand why the Treasury had so much money in his bank account at the Fed. You would have thought that they would spend it, especially during an election year. The then current administration wanted the economy to be hot as possible right. to improve their election chances, naturally. So why didn't they spend the money in this bank account that the Treasury Department has at the Fed? Well, so I finally came to understand what was going on. Remember last year, we had the CARES Act in March or April. And immediately after that, people expected a second large stimulus package of somewhere between $2 trillion and $3 trillion. Sometime early in the second half, the House of Representatives passed a $3 trillion stimulus bill that the Senate never got around to passing. The Treasury Department expected a very large new stimulus bill to be passed in the second half. So they went out and they raised a lot of money by selling government bonds. And they took the proceeds from these bonds and they put it in their bank account at the Fed, waiting for Congress to pass the stimulus bill that wasn't passed until December. And when it was passed in the middle of December, it was only $900 billion. So it was much less than they had expected. So the Treasury had borrowed all this money but Congress didn't pass any laws authorizing them to spend the money until December. And so this money just piled up in the Fed's, in the Treasury Department's bank account. When the Treasury borrows money from other people, that sucks that money out of the economy. And it stays sucked out of the economy until the Treasury Department spends it again. And normally that's not an issue because normally the Treasury spends it as fast as it gets. But because of what I've just explained, the Treasury Department sucked nearly $2 trillion out of the economy last year that otherwise would have been in the economy, in the financial markets, making the economy and the stock market even hotter than it was. So what has changed is that the Treasury Department has now told us, they publish this every three months, how much they plan to spend, how much they're going to have in their bank account at the Fed at the end of the current quarter and the following quarter. So as of February 24th, the Treasury had $1.4 trillion in its bank account at the Fed. And they said that they were going to run that down to $800 billion by the end of March and to $500 billion by the end of June. In other words, they were going to spend the money. They were going to spend the difference between $1.4 trillion in their bank account on February 24th and $500 billion on June 30th. That's $900 billion that they would spend and pump into the economy. Why are they going to spend it now? Well, there was the $900 billion stimulus bill passed in December, and now there's the $1.9 trillion stimulus bill passed in March. So now they have authorization to spend all of this money that they've already borrowed. And as they spend that $900 billion between now and the middle of this year, that's going to pump in another $900 billion on top of what the Fed is pumping into the economy through quantitative easing. So the Fed's pumping in, if you say $120 billion a month times four months, that's $480 billion. 
And if the Treasury Department also pumps in $900 billion, as they've told us that they're going to do, that's $1.3 trillion of extra liquidity is going to hit, go into the financial markets just between now and the middle of June. And that would increase the level of bank reserves, which is one important measure of liquidity. That would increase bank reserves by 39% between February 24th and June 30th. That's an extraordinary surge in liquidity that has the potential to really fuel this frenzy Juice that's markets. already occurring. Yeah. Juice is wild mania that's already grasps the markets. It could light the markets on fire. So you've got this very bullish liquidity, tidal wave of liquidity hitting the markets as the bullish story that would suggest asset prices are going to keep moving higher. And offsetting that, you have the inflation fears and the nervousness in the markets that inflation will move higher and interest rates will move higher. That is the bearish side of the story. And so these two factors, the tidal wave of liquidity versus fears of growing inflation expectations, that's likely to lead to a lot of volatility. But this weight of money could be significant enough that it overcomes the nervousness of the market about inflation and continues to push asset prices higher. Because really, this is just a tidal wave of money hitting the markets and the economy right now. This is a great answer and explanation to the question, where could we be going next? And that's some really good insight and backstory on how we get there. Richard, as we're winding down here, is there anything that you have to say about the future direction of interest rates, potentially, since we've mostly talked about the future direction of inflation? Related to that, on this topic of this tidal wave of liquidity, as the Treasury Department spends down its money in its bank account, by $900 billion, that money is going to be injected into the economy. For instance, they're sending out $1,400 checks to most Americans. Some of those Americans are going to speculate with that money. But no matter what they do with the money, it's all going to be deposited in somebody's bank account. And that gives the bank account, that gives all the banks more reserves. So their reserves go up. So my point is, this money that's coming in is so large that it has the potential not only to push up stock prices and home prices, but some of this money is like could very easily make its way into the bond market and push up bond prices and push bond yields down rather than bond yields going higher. Which keeping people, rate, interest rates low. Keeping interest rates low. So that's another possibility that could put a cap on interest rates and potentially even see them go lower without even any additional intervention by the Fed. So that's just one possibility to keep in mind. The outlook for interest rates, well, at the least, the Fed is not going to tolerate very much higher interest rates anytime soon. If the 10-year bond yield were to rapidly move up toward 2%, I think the Fed would intervene, as I mentioned earlier, and announce that that's too high and they're going to increase their bond purchases. They always say we're going to buy at least $120 billion a month. So they are free to increase that if they want to. So I don't think that the interest rates are going to go very much higher very quickly, but we'll see. A lot of people expected Fed Chairman Powell to say something already to keep in that suggests that they were going to do something to push the interest rates on the 10 year government bonds lower. And he really hasn't come forward with any kind of statement like that. Now, that's interesting. A lot of people expected that. I wouldn't have been surprised if he'd already said something to, that they were going to take some action to keep interest rates from moving higher. I wouldn't have been surprised, but he didn't. And that made me think, well, why didn't he? Well, perhaps the Fed wouldn't mind to see some correction in the stock market right now because the stocks are wildly speculative and there's a frenzy in the, market, in the stock market. The Fed doesn't want to have a crazy out of control stock market bubble that eventually blows up one day and destabilizes the financial system. Maybe the Fed would be happy to see some correction in the stock market right now, particularly given that it knows how much liquidity is about to be injected into the markets over the next four months for the reasons we've discussed. If the Fed allows the 10-year bond yields to keep moving higher, maybe it's because it's content to see some sell-off in the stock market rather than letting an out-of-control stock market bubble occur. But we always have to keep in mind that there is no doubt the Fed can control the 10-year government bond yield at absolutely any level it chooses. So you just have to ask, what level does it choose to allow the bond yield to trade at? It's always changing from week to week, depending on what happens in the markets. Sometimes I wonder how stock prices can be sustained where they are. Sometimes they get so detached from fundamentals. 
I was writing in our newsletter probably two months ago, and on that certain day when I was publishing our newsletter, the price-to-earnings ratio of Tesla was 1,700. Now, I know that this is an extreme (laughs) case, but for someone that doesn't understand that, therefore, it would take 1,700 years of Tesla earnings just to buy one share of their stock. I mean, that is just so out of whack. So this has really been interesting rationale, Richard, for the future of inflation, for why there's the potential for asset prices to be juiced. There are some reasons why the lid could be kept on interest rates for quite some time. With all this insight and everything else, you publish a lot of this and help people make forecasts and so on with your video newsletter, MacroWatch. Tell us about that. Okay, thanks. Yes, so MacroWatch is a video newsletter. Every couple of weeks, I upload a new video, essentially me making a PowerPoint presentation. Typically, they're 15 or 20 minutes long. They have 30 or 40 charts. And I discussed something important happening in the global economy. The most recent one was entitled Liquidity Tsunami Could Push Asset Prices Much Higher, discussing what we discussed during this conversation. I saw that presentation. But MacroWatch focuses on the major forces that drive the economy and the financial markets now. Those are credit growth and liquidity. I really believe that the economy no longer works the way that it did in the past. It works entirely differently now. Economic textbooks just don't explain how the economy works anymore. Once money ceased to be backed by gold, all of the classical economic theory that everyone is still taught at university ceased to explain developments going on in in the economy around us. Just one example, when the Fed creates a lot of money, that's supposed to cause high rates of inflation. Well, it hasn't. So the economy simply no longer works the way it did in the past. And so what MacroWatch focuses on is explaining how the economy truly does work in the 21st century, where money is no longer backed by gold and where we have a global economy instead of a domestic economy, and focusing on breaking developments and how they're likely to affect stock prices, property prices, bonds, interest rates, commodities, and currencies. I hope your listeners will go there and check it out. They can find it at richardduncaneconomics.com. That's richardduncaneconomics.com. And I'd like to offer them a 50% subscription discount to MacroWatch. Thank you. If they'd like to subscribe, hit the subscribe tab and they'll be prompted to put in a discount coupon code. If they use the discount code GRE, that's GRE, they can subscribe to MacroWatch at a 50% discount. And if they do, they will then get one new video from me every two weeks for the next year. And also have immediate access to all of the MacroWatch videos in the archives going back seven and a half years, something like 75 hours worth of videos explaining pretty much every important topic in global macro since then. So I hope they'll check that out. And at the very least, while they're there, sign up for my free blog. So that's at richardduncaneconomics.com. Richard Duncan telling you how the economy really works today. Thanks so much for coming back onto the show. Keith, it's my pleasure. I look forward to the next time. Me too. Oh, nice explanation from Richard, as always. And no, see, that word quadrillion still has not been brought up between he and I to date. If I had to summarize our discussion, and I only had about 30 seconds to explain it to you, I would say that to understand inflation, it's about more than money supply plus velocity. It's an expansion of credit as well. The Fed is creating $120 billion per month, every month. And then in addition to that, in the next four months, the Treasury's general account is releasing another $1.3 trillion more dollars into the system. This tidal wave of money, although it's not expected to push up inflation substantially, is likely to push up asset prices in things like real estate and stocks, and cryptocurrency. So inflation then would be staying low, interest rates low, and asset prices have a greater chance of pushing up higher than ever. And of course, none of it is going to be reflected in common inflation statistics either. Hey, coming up on the show here in future weeks, it's the return of Kristen Tate. She's an outspoken television personality on Fox News, Fox Business, and MSNBC. Before Kristen is here, though, we're going to have a super smart economist here, but we're going to talk about different subjects than we did today. He's going to be talking about how Americans build wealth 
with their own home, their primary residence? I don't know about that one. I am specifically going to bring up with him the fact that being a renter often makes more financial sense than being a homeowner and that the return from home equity is always zero. And I'll see what he says about that. That'll be in a couple weeks. As for today, big thanks to our guest with his video newsletter, MacroWatch. I mean, my gosh, if that just helps you make one good economic decision per year, that could pay for itself many times over. And that's in addition to the good in-depth education that it delivers for you. You can go to richardduncaneconomics.com to get 50% off MacroWatch when you enter the discount code GRE. Coming back at you next week for our entire GRE team here, more than half of us along for the entire ride since 2014. Operations, Andrea Newburn, Content Manager, Matthew Blunt, Sound Engineer, Bidron Jampo, Web Designer, Nikon Roy. I'm your host, Keith Weinhold. Don't quit your daydream. Nothing on this show should be considered specific, personal, or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, financial, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own. Information is not guaranteed. All investment strategies have the potential for profit or loss. The host is operating on behalf of Get Rich Education, LLC, exclusively. The preceding program was brought to you by your home for wealth building, GetRichEducation.com.